Indonesia's military declares missing submarine crew dead. Italian Coast Guard saves about 100 migrants stranded in the Mediterranean Sea. And French Jewish organizations call for justice for a murdered woman. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Jose Daniel Lopez in Quito, Ecuador, and this is from the South. The Indonesian military has declared all 53 crew members from a submarine that sank and broke apart last week dead. The military also announced that search teams had located the vessel's wreckage on the ocean floor. Officials had also said the submarine's oxygen supply will have run out early Saturday, three days after the vessel went missing off the island of Bali. An underwater uh, robot equipped with cameras found the lost submarine lying in at least three pieces on the ocean floor at a depth of 838 meters. The cause of the disaster is still uncertain. With this authentic evidence, we can declare that KRI Nengala 402 has sunk and all the crew members are dead. At a distance of about 1,500 yards south of the last dive point, at a depth of 838 meters, parts of KRI Nangala have been found. Argentine authorities have set up a military field hospital in capital Buenos Aires as hospitals have struggled to cope with a new wave of COVID-19 infections. The country's hospitals have been overwhelmed by an increasing number of COVID-19 patients and lack of oxygen cylinders. New lockdown restrictions have already put in place. Health officials have attributed the surge of the more contagious Brazilian COVID-19 variant. Argentina has recorded almost 3 million coronavirus cases and more than 61,000 people have died from the pandemic. We have a very high demand on the emergency room. Doctors on duty receive COVID and non-COVID patients in a much greater proportion than in the previous weeks. We are afraid this wave will overwhelm us, so to speak. The Manaus virus variant is in circulation in the province of Buenos Aires, in 70 to 80 percent, and that could have to do, and I say it conditionally, with the increasing cases, the severity of the cases with the infection of young people and with the severe conditions that we are seeing in older adults. On Friday, health authorities in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro announced that 90% of residents over the age of 60 have received a first dose of a coronavirus vaccine. This phase and will become one of the first capital cities to vaccinate the elderly over 60 years of age. Why did we choose the elderly? What was the justification? They are a priority group because they face the most likelihood of hospitalizations and more chances of dying from COVID-19. And staying in Rio de Janeiro, people aged over 60 are being vaccinated against COVID-19 with the AstraZeneca jab. The country has registered the world's second highest COVID-19 death toll and leads the Americas and the entire southern hemisphere on its terms of the recorded death rate. It is very bad. A lot of people are dying and we are worried. So, when we get the first dose, it already gives some relief. And when the second comes, it will be even better. We are losing a lot of acquaintances, neighbors. I hope the vaccine will calm things down, that it gets better, so we can work, take a walk, because everything has come to a halt. Colombia's anti-riot squad has entered the University of Valle to repress a peaceful protest by students. Officers launched tear gas inside the campus located in Cali to disperse students who have been occupying the university to demand guarantees to complete their studies and to reject proposed tax reforms and the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Under the justification of enforcing COVID-19 restrictions, local authorities have threatened the university students with the use of force to clear the campus. Also in Colombia, at least 22 people have been injured after armed groups attacked an indigenous march in the Department of Cauca. The attack took place after local communities began a march against the cultivation of illicit crops like coca in the region and following the murder of local indigenous governor Sandra Liliana Peña. Communities expressed their anger due to the continued violation of human rights while denouncing the lack of protection from the state. 
People aged over 80 are receiving the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine in Peru's capital, Lima, as the country accelerates its inoculation campaign using military bases and sports stadiums as vaccination centers. The country is registering more than 300 daily deaths from the virus in what inter-president Francisco Sagasti has described as the peak of the second wave. I am happy because I have brought my auntie to get vaccinated. She is 86 years old, and this vaccine will protect her from the virus that we are all suffering from at the moment. We came to get my mother vaccinated. Everything ran smoothly. There wasn't a long queue. Everything in order. They give preferences to people in wheelchairs. But now, thank God, my 84-year-old mother is vaccinated with the first dose. I didn't want him to get vaccinated. He is 96 years old, and he never gets sick but my brothers and sisters were all saying that he should be vaccinated, so we are going to get him vaccinated. 16 provinces of Ecuador enter a curfew and other mobility restrictions this Friday to, fed, to fight the spread of COVID-19. The measures will be in place for 28 days and were issued as part of the efforts to fight the rapid surge in COVID-19 infections and deaths. A nighttime curfew will be implemented from Monday to Friday while weekends will see a 24-hour curfew during which time individuals may only leave their homes for essential purposes, including the purchase of basic woods and responding to medical issues. In the remaining provinces of the country, may other measures will be in effect, such as the ban and on the sale and consumption of alcohol and the suspension of in-person classes. As the pandemic ravages the Caribbean, the region receives significant help from Cuba, India and Taiwan, while the U.S. government has largely failed to play a leading role, as noted by Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, Timothy Harris. The Prime Minister referred in a phone interview to the lack of aid from the world's most powerful country in the fight against the pandemic. The first vaccines to arrive in the Caribbean community were donated by India. Taiwan provided masks and face shields, while Cuba has sent its medical brigades to St. Kitts and other surrounding nations. The PM acknowledged that the U.S. is helping by providing $2 billion to the COVAX facility to supply vaccines to poor nations, but he stressed that the Caribbean has not seen any high-profile gestures from Washington. Harry said that it is in Washington's interest to help his neighbors. By making vaccines available in the region, the U.S. could help revive economies cut poverty and thereby curb migration. St. Lucia is again serving as a humanitarian bridge for disaster assistance to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In the wake of the latest volcanic eruption, St. Lucia has acted as an aid bridge over the, since um, April 9th eruption at last Sofri volcano forced the evacuation of tens of thousands of people. The embassies of Cuba and Venezuela in the country arranged the transfer of Cuba's airlift uh, supplies for a passage to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Cuba also sent six medical personnel to support the efforts. This week, a Venezuelan Navy ship left St. Lucian waters carrying relief goods. The country also served as a humanitarian bridge for Cuba and Venezuelan assistance to neighboring Dominica, Antigua and Bermuda, and St. Kitts and Nevis following destruction by Hurricanes Maria and Irma in 2017. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. The African Union has called for the restoration of civilian rule in Chad, where Mahamad Dridis Devi took power this week following the death of his father, Idris Devi Itno. African Union's Peace and Security Council has expressed its grave concern about the establishment of a military council headed by the son of the late president. Idris Devi Itno, who led the country for 30 years, died on Monday as a result of wounds uh, sustained in a clash against rebels in the north of the country. His son, Mohammed, who dissolved the National Assembly and government, has full powers but has promised new institutions after free and democratic elections in a year and a half. Healthcare workers receive vaccinations against COVID-19 in a remote village in the northern Sudan as part of a nationwide inoculation campaign that began last month. Sudan secured the AstraZeneca doses through the Global COVAX Initiative. 
Thank God. As a start, we at the health ministry managed to provide 3,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. We have set up workshops and trained medical staff on the methods to sterilize and follow up on the complications of the vaccine, which may occur. There is a team overseeing vaccination centers, and we have 16 other centers across the state. As a committee inspecting the side effects of the coronavirus vaccine, we have not yet found any complaints of any serious side effect. We have not even received complaints of minor side effects. In Iraq, at least 82 people have been killed and more than 100 others injured after a hospital caught fire in the capital Baghdad. According to medical sources, many of the victims were on respirators and were suffocated or burned in the smoke and flames. The COVID-19 hospital caught fire due to an explosion caused by a fault in the, the storage of oxygen cylinders. Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kademi suspended Health Minister Hassan al-Tamimi amid angry calls on social media for him to be sacked as part of a probe to, that will also include the governor of Baghdad. We were at the hospital and felt a strong explosion. There were 140 to 150 people at the hospital. When the explosion happened, we saw a fire and were not able to save the patients, so no one survived the fire. Syria has received the first batch of Chinese COVID-19 vaccines to speed up its inoculation campaign. A shipment of 150,000 Sinovac vaccines arrived in Damascus airport. The new jobs are likely to speed up the inoculation campaign in the war-torn country where a battle uh, health sector has been overwhelmed by the pandemic and where infections have been on the rise. The Chinese batch comes a few days after more than 200,000 jobs were delivered to Syria through the United Nations-led platform, which provides vaccines to the needy. The Syrian government has registered nearly 22,000 infection cases, including over uh, 1,500 deaths in areas under its control. This is the first batch of Chinese vaccines that arrived in Syria. There is another batch of 150,000 from the Chinese Red Cross that will arrive in Syria soon, God willing. These vaccines represent the good sentiments of the Chinese government and people. Egypt is said to manufacture some 40 million COVID-19 vaccines this year as demand for inoculation increases due to a new wave of the pandemic. The country's health ministry announced that experts from China are going to help setting up the production lines to help cover Egypt's and other African countries' needs. The health minister also said authorities had registered a weekly increase of up to 10% in some areas amid the third wave of the pandemic. However, he did not provide any numbers. Egypt has so far recorded about 220,000 coronavirus cases and nearly 13,000 deaths. We are ready with the production lines. Chinese expertise will be arriving in a few days. We will start working to prepare 40 million vaccines doses this year. That can be increased annually to cover all needs of Egypt from this vaccine, in addition to the African countries' needs and countries in the region. Authorities in India have extended the lockdown in the capital New Delhi for another week following the devastating new surge of infections. For the fourth straight day, India set a global daily record for new infections spurred by a new variant that emerged there, undermining the government's premature claim of victory over the pandemic. Health officials are scrambling to expand critical care units and stock up on decreasing supplies of oxygen. Hospitals and patients alike are struggling to procure a short supply of medical equipment that is being sold at an exponential markup. The health ministry reported some 2,700 deaths in the past 24 hours, pushing India's COVID-19 fatalities to over 192,000. Corona is still creating havoc and not going down. We have been talking to people and everyone is of the same opinion that the lockdown should be extended. So the lockdown is being extended by a week till next Monday, 5 a.m. The World Health Organization has expressed concerns over India's COVID-19 situation, urging other countries to be vigilant in combating the pandemic. The situation in India is a devastating reminder of what this virus can do and why we must marshal every tool against it in a comprehensive 
and integrated approach, public health measures, vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. This is a scenario that's playing out around the world and will continue to play out unless we ensure equitable access to the tools needed to save lives. The solution is straightforward. We need countries and companies that control the resources that could save lives to share. More news in a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back. Italian Coast Guards have rescued at least 100 seaborne migrants in an overcrowded boat in the Mediterranean Sea. The vessel, which had at least 100 passengers aboard, including children, had people overcrowded on the bridge and below the deck when it was spotted on Saturday. After the fishing boat uh, motor stopped working, the vessel was at the mercy of waves, which risked overturning it. It was towed by a Coast Guard to a port in Calabria in southern Italy on Sunday. The exact number of nationalities and rescue migrants were not immediately available. Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has resigned. However, he will stay in a caretaker position until the parliamentary elections take place on June 20th. He has faced calls to step down since the signing of a Russian broad peace agreement with Azerbaijan in November. Following Pashinyan's resignation, all members of his cabinet handed it ready their resignations as required by Armenian law. I thought it was important to resign today, on the Day of the Citizen. That's important because it shows that the power I give back to the citizen, the power I got from the Armenian citizen, we will respect the decision of the people and we will without any doubt fulfill our duty in front of the population. If the people decide that I should not be PM anymore, I will respect that decision. Many Armenians have welcomed Parchijan's resignation and emphasized the importance of upcoming elections. People do not want Pashinyan anymore, most of them. He does have some supporters, but there are not many of them. People do not want him. I think that these elections should not be the same as last time, but different so that we have hope again. We absolutely have to take part in these elections. It's very important to go vote and express our voice. Albanians have headed to the polls in parliamentary elections amid the virus pandemic. Prime Minister Edi Rama is seeking a third term and has promised to quit if his socialists fail to win a majority. He faces a challenge from a dozen parties united behind the main opposition Democrats. All parties say they ha will deliver the reforms needed for the Balkan nation to fulfill its dream of joining the EU a year after the bloc agreed to open membership talks. The country of 2.8 million people is among the poorest in Europe and the coronavirus pandemic has made matters worse, with the vital tourism sector suffering a huge slump. We want order and employment. Young people should not leave. They should stay here. New jobs should be created. First of all, I want my child to feel safe so that no one is harmed when they go out on the street. This is very important to me. French Jewish organizations have called for justice for a murdered woman after the killer a boy being tried on the grounds he acted in delirium due to drug taking. Jewish groups have reacted with outrage to the decision by France's highest score last Wednesday that Kobili Traoré was not criminally responsible for the murder in 2017 of Sarah Halimi. The 65-year-old Orthodox Jewish woman died after being pushed out of the window of her Paris flat by neighbor Traoré, who shouted, God is great in a rabbit. The court said he committed the killing after succumbing to a delirious fit and was not responsible for his actions. Jewish groups say the court ruling had made Jews less safe in France, while lawyers representing Hamili's family say they intend to refer the case to the European Court of Human Rights. What comes to me now that I am here is that in 1946, the Nuremberg trials condemned those on trial. 
for murdering millions of Jews. And in 2021, the Court of Cassation validated a decision which refused to condemn the men who had murdered Saddam Halimi. And for us, this caused the real pain. Israeli police have arrested at least 44 people in Jerusalem during a protest by Palestinians against Ramadan restrictions. Security forces clashed with Palestinians angry about Ramadan restrictions and Jewish extremists who led an anti-Arab march nearby. Tensions have spiked in recent days in Jerusalem, which has long been a flashpoint in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and is home to holy sites, secret for Jews, Christians and Muslims. Police used stun grenades and a water cannon to disperse protesters who then attacked Jerusalem district court with rocks and stones. Meanwhile, scores of Palestinians have rallied in Gaza to denounce the clashes in Jerusalem. Hamas leaders have warned of great repercussions for Israel because of ongoing attacks. In what seemed to be a retaliation for the incidents in Jerusalem, Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip fired three rockets toward Israel late Friday. This was later answered by Israeli warplanes, which struck the Gaza Strip early Saturday. Hamas warns of the great repercussions of the region in case the attack against the holy city and the violations against the places of worship, churches and mosques continue. Our people and its resistance will not stand idly in case of an attack against the city of Jerusalem. Hungary has reopened bars and restaurants for outdoor servers after nearly six months of lockdown. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban decided that restaurants and bars can reopen their outdoor clearances from Saturday as more than a third of the population has received at least one vaccine dose. Orban added other services such as hotels, theaters, cinemas, gyms and indoor dining will be allowed to reopen once 4 million people have received at least one shot of the vaccine, expected by the middle of next week. Hungary has carried out one of the fastest coronavirus vaccine rollouts in, the Europe, in Europe thanks to the use of Chinese Sinopharm and Russian Sputnik V jabs. But it has also one of the highest COVID-19 death tolls in the world in relation to its population size. I think that fear is slowly being replaced by a sense of freedom, the kind of trust we return that characterized humanity before COVID. And we come to the end of this news brief. You can find this and many other stories in our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.